Hello everyone, welcome to the Blossoms program on photosynthesis from MIT. My name is Dr. Kathy Vandiver and I'm pleased to be with you today. I know that many of the Blossoms programs have you speaking with your neighbors and discussing many details. But today I'm going to start with something different. I'm going to ask for you to think by yourself about a particular question. And it's going to be about photosynthesis, so I brought in something to help you start thinking about plants. And this is a very <clears throat> large log that uh, came from a tree in my backyard. And uh, I brought it here as an example just to get you thinking about what trees are made of. Because my question has to do with um, about soil and plants. And here is the question I'm going to ask for each person to respond to by secret ballot. So you will probably get a piece of paper and you'll write your answers down on the paper. So here's the question. Are you ready? Okay, what percent of a plant's weight comes from the soil? You could choose 60%, 40%, 20 10 or 1 And I'd like for you to just choose what you think is the closest answer. And then I'm going to have everybody write down their answers, and then I'm hoping your teacher will tally the results. And that I'll come back after you've done that. Remember not to discuss this detail, the details of the question with anyone else. We'd just like to know what you think. And I'll be back and I'll be wondering what your class decided. Hello, welcome back. I hope everyone has voted and that your teacher has uh, counted up your results and that you know what the results are. So um, what is the answer to this question about what percent of the plant's weight comes from the soil? Well, it's a serious question that people have been considering for many years. And so I'd like to start by just telling you about an experiment, a beautiful experiment that was done in the 1600s by a gentleman whose name is Van Helmont. So Van Helmont started off with the question about what percent of the plant's weight comes from the soil. And so he started off by weighing the soil. And he put it in a big bin like this. And then he added a uh, small tree that was five pounds at the start. Then he actually continued this experiment for five years. So he continually watered the plant. And five years later, he dried the soil and reweighed it and found out that the soil had only lost a little bit, two ounces. However, the tree itself, when it was dried and reweighed, weighed 170 pounds. And so his results really showed that the tree gained uh, 165 pounds. The soil only lost an eighth of a pound. So there was not very much coming from the soil at all. In fact, if we look at our answers here, I didn't even provide the answer that it really is. The percent of a plant's weight that comes from the soil that we've have been verified by many other experiments as well is actually 0.1% or less. So it's a surprise to many people because when I looked at many classes' results, I found that most classes were voting in the range of 40 to 20%. So before we go further in the program, I thought I'd let you know that von Helmont never did figure out that most of the mass of a plant actually comes from the carbon dioxide molecules in the air. And it's rather uh, an unusual thought if you're walking around and thinking about plants and you come to realize that plants are taking atoms out of the air and making more of themselves from it. So the roots and shoots and wood that you might see in plants actually has appeared out of thin air. So why do you think Someone like your brother and sister or your younger brother and sister might have trouble believing that a plant like this is get, getting most of its matter from the air. Why don't you talk about it, share ideas with your friends, and I'll get back to you in a little while. Okay, I'm back. And I'm guessing what you talked about. I'm guessing that you probably mentioned that the molecules are invisible, and that makes it really hard for some people to imagine them. 
but also that the molecules are so small, it really makes it hard to think that they have any weight at all. But a lot of molecules, even though like they were pieces or grains of sand, each individual sand molecule, uh, sorry, granule would be very small, but you'd still need to have a very large and strong truck to move the weight of a huge mountain of sand. So the numbers do matter. Then there's another factor, and if you stop and think a little bit about it, you'll probably remember that chemistry does point out that these atoms have some weight. We've got atomic numbers here. For instance, even for carbon here, atomic weight of 12. And you could figure out what a carbon dioxide molecule would weigh. So altogether, you've got all these molecules. And when we put them together, we can get something that does have some mass to it or weight that we can recognize as a tree. Looking at photosynthesis here as the equation that you uh, are familiar with, six water molecules, six carbon dioxide in the presence of light produces this molecule of glucose with six oxygen molecules left over. And when you stop and think about it, this glucose molecule here can be used in the plant and shown in this diagram over here in three different ways. This is a glucose molecule I've shown here built out of Lego, but we'll get back to that a little bit later. Right now, the glucose molecule could be used either for energy or it could be ch made into a very long chain, like here, this molecule of starch, which is stored in the plant in places in the roots, such as potatoes, or it could also be stored in seeds and fruits. And then the third way a plant could use its glucose is actually to make its own structure. And this is a molecule of cellulose, which is more chains of glucose, a uh, chain of glucose put together. And this structure is what I showed you originally when we started off. Um, this tree that's here, this trunk, has a lot of cellulose in it. And the other example I brought to just to show right now to remind you also that roots can also store a lot of glucose as starch right here. Now talking about starch and cellulose, I'd like to uh, point out that they're all made of glucose molecules, but interestingly, uh, they're put together in, in different ways. So for example, if this was a glucose molecule and this was a second glucose molecule, starch would look like this. It would be a long chain of regular molecules of glucose put together. However, cellulose is different, still glucose, but the second in the chain is added upside down like this, and the whole chain continues in a long fashion, alternating glucose molecules. So the connection here is really very important. Um, in starch, what I've got here, uh, our bodies, our human bodies can digest this, but our bodies cannot digest a bond that is like this. We cannot break this one. Luckily, um, there are uh, critters out there that do know how to digest cellulose. Uh, those are bacteria. And bacteria can be found in cows and help them get some energy out of the long cellulose molecules that are in grass. So we've talked a little bit about cellulose and starch and how they started off originally as being made from glucose. And um, we'd like to now stop and think a little bit more about the chemical reaction itself, and I'm going to suggest that we do an activity and talk to you a little bit more about those details next. Okay, um, before you start this activity, I just wanted to point out something about the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide actually enters the uh, plant on the underside of the leaf, and you can't see these small openings, but the picture back here does uh, indicate that the carbon dioxide is coming through those openings that are called stomata. So um, carbon dioxide is uh, going to be modeled in our activity here, and we're going to model it with these uh, bricks. If you don't have bricks, you can also use small papers. But uh, I'd like to let you know that the bricks that we have here, each one represents an atom. And the atoms that they represent are over here. We have carbon as being black. These are the regular chemistry colors. The hydrogen as being white, and the oxygen as being red. So if you're going to make a compound like uh, water here, you can easily join them together. That's one of the nice things about the bricks. They can be easily combined, just like atoms can. So coming back to the equation here, 
you can see that uh, you can actually model the entire equation through using bricks. But what I'd like for you to do is to do it stepwise, uh, pretty much the way the plant would do it. So I'd like for you first to start off with obtaining six water molecules, and you'd make, make and build them here, laid out on a piece of paper. And then what you do next would be to make the six carbon dioxide molecules. And then what I'd like for you to do is to only use these atoms to do what the plant does, is to put them together to make one molecule of glucose that's over here with these six oxygen molecules left over. Now the glucose is a rather difficult looking structure, so we do have instructions for how to build this in, our, in, the, in the module with this uh, video. And overall, we're really hoping that if you practice doing this, you'll remember it much better. And that's one of the basic things about learning, is if you can recall it very easily, um, that's great. And doing an activity sometimes makes it a lot easier. So let's give it a try. Hello, so I'm back and I hope you've had a very good time building this molecule of glucose. I know it's a little bit difficult, but I'm hoping that you were able to accomplish it and that you discovered that you did have six oxygen molecules left over. Now this is, an, a, ver this is a very important reaction in nature and uh, many textbooks oftentimes have this diagram which shows photosynthesis in this way. The fact is that the carbon dioxide is entering the leaves and the plant is giving off the oxygen. And this is great for the animals because they end up using the oxygen and giving off the carbon dioxide. And this process, the cyclic process, is sometimes called the carbon and oxygen cycle. So the reason why I'm mentioning it to you right now is I'm wondering if you would take a few moments and if you talk with your neighbor and discuss whether or not you think that plants need to use oxygen. So that's the question, do plants use oxygen? So I'm back and I, the tape is on and I know you've been talking about whether uh, plants use oxygen. So it's true, plants do use oxygen, but we've been focusing mostly on the fact they use carbon dioxide because we are focusing on the, the process of cells making their own food, which is what plant cells can do. So the carbon dioxide is utilized to build the glucose molecules. However, the glucose molecule is food for the plant as well, so it needs oxygen in order to burn those molecules and get the energy back out. And that process is called cellular respiration. Over here we can see cellular respiration. We've got the glucose molecule and when you add oxygen the energy can come out when the reaction goes in that direction. So thinking about cellular respiration, let's think about where you first thought about it and perhaps you had connected it with parts of the cell. So here we have a plant cell and the mitochondria are here and they're called the powerhouses of the cell. And also, we do have the chloroplasts that are shown here as well, full of green chlorophyll, ready for the plants to make lots and lots of glucose molecules. And this is a point that the plants actually make a lot of glucose, so much that our planet has plenty for animals to utilize as a source of food as well. So um, in thinking about our whole uh, project today in photosynthesis, we start off with a question asking, why do plants uh, need soil at all? And the soil is actually used as a, a source of minerals. They are dissolved in the water and they come on through the roots up to different parts of the cell that need the minerals. So I hope you've enjoyed learning about the basics of photosynthesis and thank you for joining us in this lesson. So hello again, this is Kathy Vandiver, um, and this is the teacher guide section for roots, shoots, and wood. And that name is really hard to say, it's an introduction, and it, the video is about photosynthesis. And I began 
to design this lesson because I first saw another video, and that video was made by the Harvard Smithsonian uh, Annenberg Foundation. And it points out that many students don't capture the information we really want them to know about photosynthesis, and that they hold on to their naive ideas that the plants actually are using the soil to make most of their matter. And so the purpose of the lesson, first of all, is to make sure that the students have an opportunity to really confront this misconception they have. Uh, they may understand perfectly your chemical equations, be able to say them, but when you ask them a point blank, blank question about the involvement of soil, many times they'll come back with thinking that soil is involved in making the plant itself. So um, in this first section, I just want to make sure that you follow through with uh, suggesting this secret vote, because many students will just copy what other people are doing if you ask them for raising your hands. And so it's essential that you capture the information that every student is thinking at the beginning. And then from there, it's much easier to uh, have the video uh, and the lesson itself evolve so there's more clarity in um, the information that they can confront the fact they had a misconception to begin with. Now some of the misconceptions that uh, have occurred and are documented are that uh, Plants may use photosynthesis to get energy, but they use soil to make their structures, which we've spoken of. And the second one is that plants do not need oxygen because photosynthesis is sort of a kind of breathing. And the third one is that plants cannot be made from air because air has no mass. And those are the major misconceptions that oftentimes uh, uh, occur. <clears throat> so I'm going to suggest that you uh, use this lesson uh, sort of after you've done one introductory piece on photosynthesis. I think that's a good time to, to catch the misconception. And uh, how the lesson, uh, how our videotape here uh, breaks down the lesson on roots, shoots, and wood is uh, part one is the secret voting, and I propose the question. Uh, part two is that uh, I will come back and talk a little bit about a lesson because a uh, famous experiment was done in the 1600s, which was asking the same question. It was Don Hamlet's investigation. And um, it was pretty interesting. He came up with the uh, recognition that 0.1% uh, of the soil uh, could be taken up by the plant. So less than 1% uh, soil was in, it was in the plant's mass. And um, so we can use that for the, the, the second part. Um, the follow-up question from part two actually is, I asked the students to please um, say why it was hard to believe that carbon dioxide is being used by the plants. Um, and I couch it in the, in the question pretty much like, um, do your students' uh, younger brothers, how would they find it, why would they find it hard to believe this? And um, it may be that the students actually find it hard to believe it, but we're, we're making it into a question they could answer for their younger brother or sister, and that makes it easier to discuss. So they sh should come up with a few suggestions for that. And I think they could be that, um, you know, that air just doesn't feel like very much mass, and how could it be turned into a solid? Um, the major length of time, however, on the pauses will be used to, uh, to do some modeling. And uh, although this modeling sounds rather simple, I think it uh, could be a really important key for having students have a better recall about uh, what actually happens in photosynthesis. So um, I'm going to show you here some of the things that would be, you'd have to do this in advance. I just want to make sure you realize that there is quite a bit of preparation for this lesson. Uh, the first thing is, is that you'll need to have a, a box that has some bricks in it, and bricks of three colors, and uh, two, uh, I chose the colors red because, and black and white, obviously because these are the colors in chemistry, white being the hydrogen and smaller. Uh, so um, the black is the carbon and red the oxygen. 
you could, if you don't have these colors, it's fine to use something that's different than that. But you need to have two large ones and two small ones. And the point is that you're going to uh, use these directions. <clears throat> these are the directions for creating this rather complicated molecule of glucose here. Um, we have made uh, the, the models have exact shapes. So this is carbon dioxide. And you are going to ask your students to write this out on a piece of paper, or two pieces of paper, if that's easier, and to illustrate the uh, equation exactly with the right numbers and the right bricks and the right shapes, and uh, the carbon, I'm sorry, the glucose as well. Um, the glucose is pretty complicated, so besides the instructions, by the way, the instructions uh, are made so a group of students can work with them. It is sometimes the best thing to do is to have one student actually read out loud the instructions for each step and uh, the other person actually be adding the brick by brick as you go along. And in case your students are not too familiar with using bricks, we are actually providing something called a layout mat or a check mat. And I'll show you this in just a second. Oh, it's up like this. And you, the students can literally put their pieces on here to check and see if they're exactly the right configuration to build them and add them on to the glucose. Now you might, you might wonder why this Lego structure is actually uh, meant to represent glucose. This uh, design was done uh, with uh, a small ring represented here and with these pieces being the side chains which are added on later. So there is a, a resemblance to glucose even though it may not be immediately obvious. Okay, so this activity will take up most of the lesson time and um, when your students are done, we will come back for one more question, and that question has to do with um, more about uh, whether plants actually use oxygen. Because students are so used to see seeing photosynthesis taking place and not thinking so much about um, whether plants use oxygen. So that's the, uh, the last question on that time frame. And at the end, um, we do close the video with the uh, uh, explanation, finally, of what do plants get from the soil? Why would they be growing in soil? And that is the minerals that the, the plant, that, I'm sorry, that the soil would provide. And so um, I'm hoping that you will uh, consider using these materials, even if you do a much more sophisticated explanation about photosynthesis, because by coming back and looking at these and the, atom, the actual atoms, the students can see this in a very concrete way that they don't forget. The actual brick here shows the carbon, and they can see that the only place where the carbon appears, that there's carbon over here as well, and it had to come from doing this process of photosynthesis. And actually what you can do to even accentuate this is to have the equation illustrated, but then remove the first this uh, side of the equation and have your six water molecules, your six carbon dioxide molecules, have your students actually reassemble those pieces and find out that, they, that this, this carbon has actually appeared again in the glucose. But the reason to do this, back to my main point, is that you really have an opportunity of making it a tremendous memorable experience and students will not forget after this that the, uh, the carbon can contribute to the cellulose and the matter that they see in the plants, which is really important for us to understand, for understanding ecology and uh, the state of the, and the future of the planet is understanding the sources of carbon and um, how the carbon goes through the cycles on, the, on our planet. So I hope you enjoy this lesson, and um, I hope you enjoy the other Blossoms modules as well.